Hubhopper Originals. To start your podcast for free, log on to studio.hubhopper.com. Hello everyone and welcome back to Indian Jeans. I'm Jokum Gonzalez, your host today, and we have the distinct honor of getting deeper into the world of innovation and entrepreneurship with a true visionary in the field. Our guest today is a dynamic force of innovation and chief innovation officer at Nova Southern University. He also holds the esteemed position of executive director of the Allen B. Levin NSU Broad Center of Innovation and spearheads a multi-million dollar public-private partnership that stands as a shining beacon attracting and nurturing the most brilliant entrepreneurial minds, cutting-edge technology and vital sources of investment capital to create an unparalleled innovation center. Indeed, his academic journey is a remarkable tapestry, having been a distinguished professor and head of the School of Aviation and Transportation Technology at Persia University, Dean of the School of Aviation at Dowling College, and a respected professor of airline management at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. His accomplishments reach beyond corporate boardrooms and into the realm of education, where he imparts his vast knowledge as an external instructor at the International Air Transportation Association, IATA, and a certified instructor at the Turkish Aviation Academy. A sought-after expert in the media, he has also provided expert witness testimony and authored two industry books, including the bestseller, Air Transportation, a Management Perspective and Wheels Up, Airline Business Plan Development. His journey from Canada's University of Victoria to earning master's and PhD degrees in international air transportation and business from Cardiff University, United Kingdom, will surely inspire and enlighten a lot of us. So fasten your seatbelts and get ready for this thought-provoking and inspiring conversation as we sit down with the brilliant Dr. John Fenswin. So John, from everyone here at Indian Genes, a very, very warm welcome to you. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. I know that I was wanting to speak to you for a long time, but I'm just happy that you made time and, and time when I say for you, a busy person out from your schedule uh, to spend time to talk to us here in India. Well, I am so excited to be able to reconnect after all of these years, and I'm very excited to have a listening audience in India. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but I've had multiple trips to India uh, over the course of my career when I was in the airline industry, and I continue to follow the trends and the opportunities that are occurring in that region of the world, and I'm just so excited to to get connected again. Absolutely. And uh, with us here at Indian Genes, John, most of our listeners are probably people who are coming up the ranks in as far as their careers are concerned in university, they're deciding or making decisions on which direction to go. And I think as far as entrepreneurship is concerned, we've not really touched on that topic here at Indian Genes. We've spoken about other academic avenues or areas that an individual could pursue. But I think I waited for you because you would be the right person. And I do know that your new book is out where you have yourself come up with this brilliant new model on entrepreneurship. So why don't you first tell us a little bit about the book? What was the idea where I know it is the ninth, uh, ninth edition, but putting all this together, uh, it would be nice if you could just go through your whole journey and then we could end up at the book and towards uh, entrepreneurship. Okay. You may be sorry that you said, hey, let's go through your whole journey because I'm going to start at the age of three, but I promise you I'll accelerate it. <laughs> um, so I was born and raised in Vancouver, Canada. And when I was a little over three years of age, my parents uh, decided that they were going to take our family on our very first airplane ride ever. And we were going to go from Vancouver to Hawaii. And it was Christmas time. And my parents dressed me in a U.S. Air Force flight suit. It was a tan suit with the golden lapels and the wings. And uh, and that little did I know then that this was the start of my entire professional journey and personal journey uh, as it relates to aviation. 
And as we boarded the airplane, it was a bright orange 747. It was taxiing to the runway and came to a sudden stop. One of the engines had caught on fire and they had to evacuate the aircraft. They deployed the slides and, and everybody went out the side of the airplane. And for me, and although I only remember little bits and pieces, I fell in love with aviation. That was the day that I caught the aviation bug and all the stars just seemed to align. Here I am in a pilot uniform. I'm going through this incredible experience. And as a young kid that doesn't know anything, it was nothing but excitement. But for everybody else in my family, it was the complete reverse effect. And 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 uh, and it had a really quite a negative impact, especially on my mother, who became terrified of airplanes from that point. So she didn't really love the idea that I wanted to either learn to fly an airplane or, or work in that industry. And consequently, that was the dream that I set for myself. And as I got a little bit older, truly in my childhood years and teenage years, I said, I'm going to work in the airline industry. I want to learn how to fly an airplane. I'd like to be a commercial pilot. Um, and then I realized as I actually started flying and did quite a bit of it when I was young, I realized that I became very, very interested in the business side of aviation. And although I didn't know it, I was actually an entrepreneur in the making and I didn't have anybody around me that really understood what my dreams were. In fact, what I really got around me was more negative influence saying, hey, uh, you think too big. You're, you're, you're a dreamer. Bring your, your, your body back down to earth and truly uh, do something that everybody else does in terms of a career. So go to school, get a job, and just be happy. And that was not something that was satisfactory to me. And even to this day, I'm now 52, and I've had a, a pretty interesting career pathway where I've had the very fortunate opportunity to do a lot of things where I've worked in traditional uh, employment uh, positions. I've um, had the entrepreneurial journey and been able to build um, some successes along the way, which ultimately have led to where I am uh, right now in terms of career. We'll get to that in just a second. But when you talk about my journey, I went through a lot of peaks and troughs, if you will, ups and downs and, and met a lot of challenges and really had to find my own way through life because I didn't really have a lot of great mentorship around me and I didn't know how to access resources that would ultimately allow my dreams to come true. So I came to this conclusion at some point very early in my life that when somebody says, no, you can't do it, I'm going to prove the world wrong and show you that I can do it. And I still actually have that as part of my thinking process today. And my ultimate dream was to learn to fly an airplane and then start an airline. So I learned to fly the airplane and I actually was part of the initial co-founding startup team to actually start an airline. And it was an international um, carrier that flew on the transatlantic and we, we broke some new ground creating an all business class aircraft environment and sold it at the high end of economy price and long story short it ultimately failed but it did go public but there were a lot of external factors that influenced the success of that uh, particular initiative and my dreams were ultimately were crushed because how could one come up with the best airline model in the world and then have it die uh, over time but the external factors were really around things like rising fuel and oil prices increased competition on the transatlantic markets perhaps utilizing the wrong aircraft, high overhead expenses, et cetera. And a lot of lessons were learned around that. And as I start going through my uh, journey from the time that I actually decided to go to work, I was 19 years of, uh, of age when I got my first real job in the airline industry. But before that, I worked at McDonald's. The day I turned 15, I started working at McDonald's as a lobby boy cleaning floors. And I realized very quickly that that's not the kind of job that I wanted to have for the rest of my life. And I also learned that I didn't take authority very well and that I really needed to do something in terms of my career journey that allowed me to be in charge of my own destiny. And that's what really drives me to this day. So after I started working at 19 with this airline, it was a brand new company called Canada 3000 Airlines. We ultimately grew to become the largest scheduled charter airline in the world. And we were the launch customer of the Boeing 757 and the A320. And I spent about three years there in between my undergraduate degree. And as I got towards the end of my three years there, doing some incredible things that I would never get the opportunity to do today, I realized I needed to go back to school and I went back with a different mindset. I did very well in my final two years of my undergrad. And then I decided that I should probably pursue, pursue my schooling. And I ultimately went and pursued my master's and my PhD uh, degrees in the United Kingdom. And I ended up at Cardiff University in, in Wales. And I accelerated through that program and really focused on a research topic that would help address 
how you can improve the aviation industry in Europe and then replicate that around the world and had some very interesting results with my research that led to some changes in regulatory process within the European uh, Union and how airlines and airports operate uh, more successfully. And then after I graduated, I ended up becoming a professor of airline management at an organization called Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, which is the largest aviation and aeronautical university in the world. Spent five years there and realized that in my off time, I wanted to be busy doing things around aviation. And that's when I started writing papers and doing some consulting work and starting my speaking career. And that ultimately led to the creation of my very first book called Air Transportation. And at the time, it was known as Air Transportation, a management perspective. And consequently, um, the ninth edition just came out this last May. And it's been an incredible journey for me because as I went from my academic career back into industry and then back into higher education, a lot of those experiences allowed me to see the world in a different way and particularly focus on an industry like aviation and think about the trends, the challenges, the opportunities and the strategies to always put these ideas and thoughts into a book that just gets bigger and better every time that we do it. So when I left my Amber Riddle position, I ended up going into a consulting role and helping a number of startups around the world and then decided that I really wanted to be back in aviation higher education. And then I became a dean of a, a very established program in New York. Um, I ultimately became the head of aviation at Purdue University uh, in Indiana and grew it to be the second largest aviation program uh, in North America. Um, decided to go back to industry for a little bit. And along that journey, we did create the, the airline that, that I said earlier went public. And uh, that afforded me some opportunities to do some pretty incredible things. And my entire career journey, and I'm skipping a lot of things that happened along the way, ultimately led to the position that I'm in right now as the very first chief innovation officer of the largest private university uh, in the state of Florida called Nova Southeastern University. And I'm also the executive director of the Levant Center of Innovation, which is the largest innovation center that's been built in the Southeast region of the United States. And, and we can talk more about what that model is. I think it's very relevant to our conversation around innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship. But we started this with leading up to the book. So my, my book has just been renamed and it's now Air Transportation, a global management perspective. And it is the ninth edition and it is the best selling air transportation book in the world within its category. And the reason that I added global to it is because I made it much more international than ever. It used to be very much focused on the United States. And now what I've done is I've created sections in there that address what goes on in terms of trends, challenges, opportunities, and strategies in aviation in all six regions of the world as established or defined by the International Civil Aviation Organization. And, uh, and what's relevant to that is that we're taking a U.S. model but applying it to the world to show how things are similar and how things are, are different and that it still is probably the most high profile industry in existence, but also one of the most challenged in terms of its ability to continue to be profit, uh, profitable and to enhance the infrastructure that you need to have a very seamless and accelerated um, aviation environment where there's still a, a lot of work to be done. That's absolutely brilliant. I think the term, the founder's journey, sits really well with what you've just said because you started at the age of three, and my question to you would be, uh, as an entrepreneur, do you think that there are signs if there are parents listening to this or there are teachers or, or, or students themselves listening to this, are there early signs of an entrepreneur or is it something that you learn, develop because of the environment around you? You know, that's a really interesting question. And when I was young, I was always taught that in order to be an entrepreneur, you have to be born with entrepreneurship in your in your DNA. It's in your blood. And I always questioned that because I don't believe that's true. And I believe that, yes, you can be born with that in your DNA. And it may be passed down between you know, generations within a family. And you start a business and then the children come into the business and they, and they grow it. And, and, and there is a model for that. But I also believe that not everyone, but a good majority of our population can be taught to be an entrepreneur. And you start by defining what is an entrepreneur. And an entrepreneur truly, in terms of simple definition, is an enterprise builder. They see a challenge, 
and they come up with a solution that you can implement successfully and, and commercialize it, and then you grow your business. And, and I think that if you teach somebody about an entrepreneurial mindset or an innovation mindset, you can be very successful as long as you understand the formula for success. So number one is defining what an entrepreneur is. That will, will determine who will move to the next level of being an entrepreneur. And then after you've defined it, you have to figure out what the model looks like. And, and, and I try to simplify everything as, as much as possible. And I always believe that if something doesn't fit on one page, it's probably not worth reading. So in, in the world of entrepreneurship, I think that if you have the right plan, the right people, and the right money, and you have the right mindset, then you can be an entrepreneur. And then there's another word that I like to throw into that mix, and it's intrapreneurship. And a lot of people are not familiar with it. So they're, a, a true entrepreneur is going to take risks. They know that there are going to be probably more failures than there are successes along the journey. But when they fall off the horse, they get right back on it and go. And if somebody falls off the horse and they don't have the eagerness and drive to get back on it and ride it, they're probably not going to be a very successful entrepreneur. That doesn't mean they're going to be a failure. So I always encourage people to also have a full understanding of what intrapreneurship is. And that's somebody that works in more of a stabilized environment. It may be an existing company, but companies still have to grow and they have to grow from within. So you can be an entrepreneur inside an established business environment, but now you're an entrepreneur because you're also addressing challenges and you're building strategies that you implement that hopefully result in successes. So in that regard, you are an entrepreneur. You're just working within the safety net of a more structured environment where you most likely will have uh, financial compensation and, and benefits and the security of working for uh, a company. So there's really those two different worlds. There's so much there, uh, John, that is very interesting, and I would like to uh, hear more from you. But getting back to the origin of the entrepreneur, and my thought has always been, like you said, you could be you could be born with that skill, but if, and we will come back to your framework a little bit later, but if you truly understand what is what the path is going to actually lead to, then it would become easier. But Normally, why does it happen that there, there happens to be certain centers of innovation? For example, when you're talking about entrepreneurs, I don't know whether it's the geography or it's what you just spoke about, a combination of academics and funds and government and set up or support. But if you take Silicon Valley, for example, and you talk about a lot of the techies there, everything seems to be based in Silicon Valley. Now, how does Silicon Valley happen to be the center for innovation? Was it built? Did it happen? Or just a few people that decided this was going to be the place as opposed to other centers around the world, for example? You know, that's also a really interesting discussion because Silicon Valley um, is very unique and it's almost impossible to adapt or replicate it and then create another Silicon Valley somewhere in the world. It's kind of like, Southwest Airlines, which um, traditionally in the United States has been considered the most successful airline in the world. And it's in every business school case study um, globally uh, about why they were successful as they were, as they matured. Now they have challenges. And many airlines around the world have tried to replicate the Southwest Airlines model and, and copy it, and then hopefully they would be successful. And, and we found that that doesn't work. So it's just because one thing is successful, it doesn't mean it's going to be successful somewhere else. And Silicon Valley has done something over many, many years where it, it really started with a number of people that just had ideas around technology, and then successes started to happen, and that bred more success. And if you look at Silicon Valley, what they've really developed over numerous decades is a true, what I'll call an innovation ecosystem. I don't say it's a tech hub because I think it's much bigger than that. And to me, a tech hub is a designation, but an ecosystem is a world. And an innovation ecosystem consists of a number of different elements that represent the public and private sectors. It's it's research universities, it's government uh, research labs, it's private companies, it's public um, organizations that all bring together this ecosystem of skills and resources and infrastructure. And over time, when they start to overlap with one another, they begin to mature and these ecosystems begin. 
And, and Silicon Valley is truly the first place in the world that built such an innovation ecosystem. And what's interesting about it is that as successful as it has been, there's also been a lot of challenges along the way, which has resulted in other geographic centers built, not just in the United States, but all over the world, including India. And if you think about what drives these ecosystems, you need ideas, you need talent, uh, like skill talent, so qualified skill talent versus just talent. Uh, you need funding mechanisms, and you need other pieces of resources to build uh, on these solutions that ultimately are commercialized. And Silicon Valley is now in a situation where they're actually losing much of their population because they've fully matured. And the cost of doing business in Silicon Valley is is prohibitive for a lot of uh, organizations, particularly the early stage startup companies, which has now led to a movement which places like Austin, Texas, for example, has grown. And it's an innovation ecosystem or a tech hub. Uh, you look at Boston, Massachusetts, um, New York City, um, just the, the Dallas, Fort Worth area, also in Texas, and then things that are happening in London and the growing innovation ecosystem and Paris. I mean, it's happening all over the world. And one of the ways, uh, one of the driving factors is also the creation of incubators and accelerators. And they've been around for years, but they're taking on a new evolution of life. And incubators and accelerators are essentially environments. Some of them are very structured and purpose-built, and some of them are not structured. They're not a physical location, but they're more professional networks. But the, the, the definition of an incubator and accelerator, it's a place that you can go to where you have an instant network and access to resources where you can incubate ideas that then become accelerated businesses. And there's a whole lot of elements that make up the puzzle of what makes a successful incubator and what makes a successful accelerator, but they're popping up all over the world, kind of like how airline um, route networks have been popping up all over the world for years. And then eventually those networks start to overlap with one another. And at some point in time, they become a hub and spoke system where there's a lot of focus on a particular city that are now connected to, to the spoke network. And that's exactly what's happening right now with the, uh, the innovation uh, ecosystem around incubators and accelerators. And that's exactly how Silicon Valley grew and it will continue to grow. It's just slowing down. And many of the, the stakeholders there have found that there are other places to go that are more friendly in terms of business environment and, and costs as an example. Interesting, very interesting. And getting back to you mentioning the word, oh, that's the first time I heard the word, which is entrepreneurship. Now, for an individual, if you have a particular individual who is in a, in a particular job function, then do you think that the sequence for an entrepreneur, though he wants to be an entrepreneur one day, but you would want to cut the risks because survivorship bias does tell us that there are there are generally more failures than one person who does succeed so is it the right thing to do is you continue where you are in a job for example as an entrepreneur uh, weigh those results and see whether you're actually then cut out to be an entrepreneur and that would be a safer way to go rather than take the risk move out and move forward with this great idea that you have in mind so I don't think that there's an official pathway of how you become an entrepreneur and develop an entrepreneur. And there are those that are out there that say, if you got an idea, just go make it happen. And there are others that say, oh, pursue your formal education and then go launch your idea. My personal advice to, to younger people, if they truly want to be an entrepreneur, number one, you have to have a dream and don't let anybody around you crush that dream. So if you're, you think big and, and think about dreams that you might not accomplish, but at least you've got a, a big target to work towards. And the idea is that that's a destination. So ultimately, how do I get from where I am to the ultimate desti destination that I dream of, knowing that you're going to create a highway to get you from point A to point B, also recognizing that as you fail or you're thrown different obstacles, there are going to be exits or off ramps from that highway that are going to take you away from your destination. And then ultimately you got to figure out strategically how to get back on that highway of life to ultimately hit that destination. And I think that education is probably the most important thing that anyone can pursue because 
knowledge is the biggest asset that anyone can ever acquire. And then you'll quickly realize that time is also one of the most critical things in our life. We don't have a lot of time. So how do you accelerate your success? How do you ultimately get to that dream? And my best recommendation in terms of a pathway is to pursue education. And that doesn't always mean getting a degree. It may be an industry certification or multiple stacked credentials of certifications. It might be getting that associate degree, that bachelor's degree, that graduate or postgraduate um, degree. The whole point there is get skills behind you, qualifications, so that you learn. It also adds relevancy to who you are in terms of the audience that you'll be speaking to or engaging with. And I always encourage people to actually go into the workforce and actually work in a real job. And the idea there is one, you get to mature and really massage your ideas. You get to learn from others and build networks. You may even discover that there are other challenges out there that you didn't recognize. And because you've got more skills behind you and more knowledge, that your idea might even become something that's redefined and even bigger than what you originally intended to do. And I've had this discussion with my daughter multiple times where she said she wanted to be an entrepreneur and we helped gear her down a pathway that allowed her to work when she was young. She realized what she liked to do and didn't like and what her skill set was. We then, not say forced, but we gave her a lot of guidance about why it's important to pursue your education. And in her choice, she decided to go and pursue an undergraduate degree and she did it in the field of, um, of business, and she wanted to focus on the fashion industry, fashion merchandising. And then as she realized that her biggest idea of becoming a designer uh, wasn't really there, and maybe that wasn't my best talent, And but I still want to be an entrepreneur. I still want to build businesses. So when she graduated, she ended up working for a company that is very entrepreneurial in nature, and she is what I call an intrapreneur. She went from being hey, I think I'm an entrepreneur, I really want to be one, but now that I'm working in this environment where I'm working with company that acquires small failing companies and grows them, I've realized I'm now an entrepreneur. I'm actually building businesses from within, and this is the pathway that I'm going to set for the rest of my life. What she probably doesn't recognize yet, because she's still younger, she's going to learn that as she's been building the entrepreneurship mindset and model, she can easily step out into the world as an entrepreneur and be successful because you've already developed the skills that are going to be needed to to, to be successful um, along that journey. So I'm not sure if that answers your question directly because I don't think it's a true black and white answer. I think there are multiple pathways of opportunity depending on the personality and the skill set and the drive of the individual. But if you're looking for a, a more of a formula, it's get an education, get credentials and skills, build a network, get real hands-on job experience and when the time is right then you'll be, you'll know when it is to, in order to to, to, to fly uh, from the nest and, and go to the next phase of your growth true and probably this is the best time now to formalize what we've been talking about to put a framework to it and it would be interesting to hear from you i do know you've got an amazing uh, you've put together an amazing concept or framework on entrepreneurship so why don't you just take us through uh, I think you do have certain pillars there, and probably that's where you want to start. And I'll let you take us through this idea of yours. Sure. So a little over three and a half years ago, um, I was in a, a very interesting career uh, position. And and I got to the point where I was trying to think about what I wanted to do next. And I had some ideas, and ultimately it was going to involve a relocation to um, to London. And as we started the the process of of moving in that direction, I was headhunted by a a search firm, and the search firm approached me and said that we've had numerous individuals nominate you for a potential opportunity, and none of those individuals know each other which led us to believe that maybe you know something um, that we don't and you could help us with a problem that we have. And I said, okay, well, I'm willing to listen and see what it was. And at the time I was living in Miami, uh, Florida. I now live in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, which is just north of Miami. And after talking to this firm and then being introduced to who's now my employer, 
they came to me and said that they wanted to build what they call an innovation center. And I don't think they fully recognized what an innovation center was. Uh, it was a very small vision, good vision, but small. And I said, I think this may be the right opportunity for me right now in my time, because everything I've ever done in my life professionally and even personally has led to this point where now I know what I want to do. And what I said is I would like the opportunity to create the world's first theme park for entrepreneurs. Imagine a purpose-built facility that's highly customized, that has a number of rides inside that ultimately support an entrepreneur at every stage of their life cycle, but also acts as a giant collision station that forces for the very first time in the world to converge entrepreneurs with academia, industry, government, funders, professional networks, wraparound service providers, and a whole lot more. And if we could figure out how to reverse engineer the success of, of an entrepreneur, literally from the birth of an idea, right through the successful exit of a company, or maybe it's a global expansion opportunity that the company wants to pursue, and you could do it under one roof and then virtually connect it to the world to link into other innovation ecosystems, entrepreneur hubs, et cetera, what would that look like? So I, I told the, the, the president that I report to, um, and so now we're talking about Nova Southeastern University, which I mentioned is the largest private university in Florida. I said, I am your person as long as we have one rule. And he said, well, what is that? And I said, the one rule is there can't be any rules. Otherwise, you're not going to be innovative. And what I don't want is to create an academic-focused innovation center. It needs to be industry focused, meaning that it's free from the bureaucracy and red tape of an academic environment, and that it truly works with industry and government and academic stakeholders to build something extremely unique. So the best way to describe what we've built here is we've we've took a space, and I'll, I'll, I'll use US metrics, it's 54,000 square feet. It is a giant facility, and we designed it from the ground up with the idea of what we call the founder's journey in mind. So the founder's journey is literally the four cycles that an entrepreneur goes through from starting an idea to launching the idea to growing the company and exiting the company. And we define that as four pillars. So the whole environment is concentrated on three themes, which is innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship, because it's innovation that leads to the creation of new technologies that leads to these entrepreneurial journeys, which we define as the founder's journey. And the four pillars or life cycles within the founder's journey include ideate, incubate, accelerate, and post-accelerate. So the idea eight stage is when I come in and I'm just trying to create an idea for a business opportunity. The incubate stage is I'm massaging that idea so that it actually results in a real business plan. And then accelerate is the launch of my company, or maybe I'm already in the market, I've already got a proof of concept, but now I have the ability to scale that company. And what we do is focus not on small business growth, but large business growth. So how do you create the next Amazon, the next Kindle, the next Uber, the next DoorDash or Uber Eats as an example. And then that's where Post Accelerate comes in. And frankly, this is where most entrepreneurs never get to. But those that make it, this is the merger, the acquisition, the initial public offering or IPO or the international expansion uh, that comes with the scalability of their company. And within this 54,000 square feet of space, we have a number of tools within a toolbox including a military grade cybersecurity range. And we, we allow entrepreneurs to access that as well as industry and government for training and research and, and grant opportunities, et cetera. We've created a media production studio. It's a soundproof facility where entrepreneurs can go in and they can do their marketing and branding pitch presentations. They could do their prototypes uh, in terms of video production. It's podcasts, webcasts, radio, television interviews, uh, something that an entrepreneur doesn't have access to on a daily basis, but we make that available to them. We have something called a technology makerspace, a customized environment that has robots and drones and 3D printers and 3D scanners. 
we're in the process of building an artificial intelligence digital cities lab where you'll be able to go in and mastermind the design of an entire city right down to the sewer pipe installation and and test different types of simulated environments using augmented virtual and mixed reality we're also building something called a volumetric capture studio which is very forward thinking and in today's world we talk about holograms and uh and the, the, the future and avatars and the future is way beyond that. It's your digital twin. So how do you replicate yourself and then superimpose you into any environment you can ever dream of through a, a very specific built um, studio that captures your video and then puts you into the environment you want to create? Uh, we're also creating a mobile innovation unit. So it's an innovation center on wheels in the form of a double-decker bus that I'm having built in Europe. And then we'll import it and do the, the retrofit of it here in the United States. And then we'll take emerging technologies and our programming out into underserved communities, specifically to find those entrepreneurs that may not know they're entrepreneurs, or they are, but they don't have access to programming and infrastructure, and we'll bring it in a mobile environment to you so that we can increase your accessibility to resources and hopefully make you successful and, or successful and to do it in an accelerated time. And our Founders Journey programs that we have, um, you basically apply, you get accepted, and through a four, six, or 12-week program, you learn how to build your business. You get exposed to a professional network of people that have been there. They've done it. They're doing it. You get access to potential funding mechanisms. And and this, these types of environments didn't exist really 10 years ago. They're relatively new. And what we wanted to do is something different than what anybody has ever done. So it's an incubator. It's an accelerator, but it's a whole lot more than that. And it's truly an economic development engine for our region. And it's also a, uh, an education development engine for our region that truly has local, regional, national, international impact. And to make it even more successful for the, for the entrepreneur, we do this all free. So we reduce and remove the barriers of entry for the entrepreneur. So if we can find you and you can find us, this is literally your toolbox to build your idea and your business. And there are very few places in the world that have the opportunity to do this. And when we say we have global impact, we've created something called a country desk model where we identify innovative nations from around the world. We sign a formal agreement with that country and then we import the entrepreneurs and the investors from those countries right here into this Levan Center of Innovation, which becomes the portal for successful U.S. market entry. But then we also allow our entrepreneurs to have ex, um, access, so we export them to those countries in terms of their ideas and, and their networks that they need to be connected to so they can truly have an international impact with the businesses that they are, are growing. And then finally, we do make it virtually connected so that you can become a member of the Innovation Center anywhere in the world and still have um, access is more limited and restricted, but you do get access to a communications platform and to some of our programs and participate in some of the virtual events and take advantage of, of some of those services. So you could be somebody in India and you could become a member of the Levant Center of Innovation and have an instant access to the network that we've built. That's so amazing. In fact, you towards the end did mention, uh, answer one of the questions I had for people listening to you here in India, they have direct access to what I now would look at as you call it the theme park for entrepreneurs. And it's all really, really exciting. And I just wanted to also understand from you, John, generally, when you talk about you, you, sp you spoke about uh, an idea, and then you spoke about incubating and accelerating that idea. Generally, do you tend to see uh, people uh, as entrepreneurs, so, uh, people who have not moved on to become entrepreneurs, do people to tend to spend more time in the incubate stage? And what do you do to get out of that? Because you keep thinking about the idea and then over analyzing it and then probably with time not moving forward. Yeah, if somebody's doing this on their own, they may not recognize that they're actually going through an ideate and incubate and accelerate. Um, stage and 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 this is where most people fail is they think about an idea but they can't get beyond the idea so you lose a lot of people at the IDA stage unless they're in a structured environment um, in our environment and we're we're only a little over a year old now we uh, our one-year anniversary was this last April 2023 um, but we at that time we had a 100 percent completion rate of our ID8 incubate and accelerate programs and we're now at a 99 percent completion rate because one individual had to leave for personal reasons but it showed that 
if you're in a structured environment like this and you are willing to in, invest your time and energy to it, you are most likely going to be successful. If you try to do this on your own with no structure around you, chances are you're not going to be successful and you're probably not going to make it beyond the ID8 stage. Um, in our particular case, we've got people that have gone from ID8 into, into, into Incubate and then into Accelerate. And we've also had individuals that have come in at different levels of program or they came into the, the Incubate or they came into the Accelerate. And they're still successful because we were able to get them on track and put them in the right direction. So ID8 should be able to get through it pretty successfully. If you're in the structured environment, you should be able to get through Incubate and Accelerate. And you bring up a very good point. This is truly where you either make or break yourself in terms of getting to the next level. And at this point, this is where some individuals will now recognize that entrepreneurship is just not for them. Uh, there's a perception that as an entrepreneur and being your own business owner, that you can take as much time off from work as uh, whenever you want. You've got more money than you've ever dreamed of. You can do anything you want. And the reality it is, of it is, is that's not true. Um, you're going to work more hours as an entrepreneur than you are in a structured business environment. In my case, I work 16 hour days almost every single day. I make a lot of personal sacrifices, which I've done through my entire journey. And I had to, I had to acknowledge that. And I sacrificed, you know, a, a number of things. I got married later in life because I was too busy building a, a career. Um, I missed out on a lot of my social life and, and friendship networks because I was so bu busy building businesses. And for me, it was the right thing to do. And, and I have no regrets whatsoever. But you have to recognize around that incubate accelerate stage what the life of an entrepreneur is like because it is not easy you are going to struggle and when you hear that hey this person's been wildly successful what you're probably not hearing is that they also had numerous failures before they got there and when you hear about these extremely big multi-million dollar exits it's like being struck by lightning. It doesn't mean you can't do it, but you also have to recognize that not every entrepreneur is going to achieve that level uh, of success, but that's what helps drive you if that's what you're trying to do. But being an entrepreneur is probably the most difficult job that there is. And, and I, I use the term job loosely because it's not a job. It's a lifestyle. It's a passion. It's energy. It's a dream. And you have to have all of this within you in order to be successful and it really comes back to the fact that you're either made for it or you're not, but you need to learn early on. And that's one of the things that we do is we educate you on what it's like to be an entrepreneur so that you're not shocked later on and then recognize, oh my goodness, I wasn't built to, to be able to do this. So we try to screen people through that process before they're formally accepted into our programs. And we have a very detailed application process. And when we analyze it, we recognize that, you know what? You're probably not built to be an entrepreneur, but we don't want to turn you away. So here's another opportunity that we can offer you to help you be successful, whatever pathway um, you choose. Or maybe there comes a point where you, you maybe you mature or you change your mindset or something in your life changes where now you're ready to, to pursue that entrepreneurial dream. And then if you get into this type of environment and you can accelerate, there's going to be a long time lapse between you between accelerate and post accelerate. And you may never make it to post accelerate and that's not a failure accelerate is you just continue to grow your business but post accelerate is truly scaling the business at a very high level and again you're seeking the merger the acquisition the public offering the international expansion or significant investments the series uh, b's the series c's uh, as we define them but uh, that's the ultimate dream for most entrepreneurs right and when you get through this particular cycle of <clears throat> probably accelerate and then expansion for somebody starting off as in uh, uh, in the early stages or probably a person not even knowing which stage they are how do you uh, outcomes become very important how do you measure the success of a particular idea if it is a new idea then you cannot measure it against any other metric because it's never been done before and what probably would also come in, you mentioned the word uh, a person being happy. You mentioned that word when we started. Now, an, entre an entrepreneur could be happy with what the result is, but you may think that it's actually much lower than what is expected or, what, or the potential of the idea. So how do you play around with 
a measurement for an entrepreneur? That's an interesting question. Um, so what is an entrepreneur trying to do? An entrepreneur generally has identified some kind of problem or challenge that needs a solution. And they may be in a very competitive environment where others have said the same thing and they're doing it. And you are hopefully trying to enter that market opportunity and you're not just trying to replicate what somebody else has done. You're going to look at what others have done and you're going to say, hey, there's something missing. I can do this better. And that's what's going to hopefully drive you over the finish line. And I think that there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there that try to copy what others are doing. And they said, oh, I'm, I'm going to do the same thing just under a different brand name. And, and that's not going to lead to your success. You've got to think about what others are doing and how you can be better at, at whatever that that challenge is, whatever that solution is, the product, um, the service, or maybe it's a combination of both. And the other extreme is that maybe you have an idea that nobody's ever thought about. And this puts you into an interesting territory because you don't have a benchmark to take your idea and, and benchmark it against what others have done. And therefore, that's an opportunity, but it's also a bit of a hindrance or a challenge because you have to convince whoever your audience is, that you've got something so unique that can be wildly successful and I'm going to show you why. And and you need to show primarily um, how this is done in, in the form of your business plan. So your, your first interaction in the world of entrepreneurship is how do you kick your idea and put it into the form of a business plan? And I always say, if you don't have a plan, better plan to fail. And a lot of entrepreneurs don't even think about the concept of building a pro forma business plan that is your roadmap. It shows you, here's my idea. Here's how I'm going to build it. Here's what it takes to build it. Here are the expected outcomes. And remember, it's a plan. So it's not set in stone. It's your roadmap that you're going to follow knowing that it's going to change. So that's your first benchmark for, for measuring your success. The second is, am I convincing people when I talk to them that I've got a unique value proposition that people are going to be interested? They're going to want to invest into it, whatever that is defined as. And investment is not always money. And am I, do I have the ability to recruit a team? So if I'm going to hire people to come into my, my startup company, do they believe in what we're doing? And am I, am I going to have a challenge recruiting people? And if you can recruit successfully, then it, sh it validates that your idea is good and, hey, we can get to that next stage. When it comes to the fundraising component, who are you talking to? And this is one of the biggest challenge. You may have the best plan in the world and the best idea in the world. It's kind of like having the best website in the world. And if you don't have tools to draw people to that website, then it's irrelevant. So how do I draw people to what I'm doing? And when you start talking to, to, to money, Traditionally, entrepreneurs, particularly early stage, they go to the friends and their family to get their initial seed funding to get them to the next level. That's not something that I generally encourage because if it doesn't work out, it can lead to you know, other personal issues with, with your family and, and your friends. But how do you get to the angel investment communities? How do you then get to the venture capital communities, which would be the, the next evolution of, of, of investment? But Every one of these phases that you go through have benchmarks. So if angel investors like what I'm doing, okay, it's validating my concept. If I start to grow and I'm in business and then the venture capital markets like what I'm doing, oh, it's validating what I'm doing. And, and, and these are how you measure your levels of success. But you have to be honest with yourself. Um, you're going to make mistakes. And the most important thing, and this is so important for young people to understand, and I learned about it too late in life, I think, but now I follow this, is that when you make a mistake, you have to acknowledge the mistake. Why did I make it? How do I learn from it so that I don't do it uh, again? And if you don't acknowledge your mistake, then you're probably not going to be successful um, as an entrepreneur because you have to use that as a as a learning experience. And then I think it's also important to to find people that have accomplished what you've set out to do. So how do you link yourself to other successful entrepreneurs? And you'll find that in the innovation ecosystem, the entrepreneurial ecosystem. To entrepreneurs that have been successful, the thing they want to do with their life more than anything is to give back. They want to mentor young entrepreneurs in the making, as, and they want to do it for free because they want to show them how to be successful, and then they get instant gratification for, for being able to do that. And that becomes one of the big assets of an innovation center 
or an incubator or an accelerator is you get exposed to the mentorship communities and, and they're going to help walk you along your journey and show you how to do it right and help you when you get off track. So if something's going wrong, they're going to be the best asset around you to get you back on track. And then finally, the most important thing is listen to people, act like a sponge, absorb that information. But at the end of the day, don't let anybody tell you what to do. You have to make the best decision that makes the most sense for what your heart and your brain is telling you to do. But use that information as guidance. But at the end of the day, you need to make the decision. Probably what we see these days talking about areas of innovation, for example, it's a bit different to about 20 years ago because we were innovating in all fields, in all areas. People with different skill sets could move into innovation. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but most of what we hear today is innovation around tech. So, for example, if I'm not a tech guy, then I have to sit back and think twice, well, if I want to be an entrepreneur, which direction do I have to go? Because all the big ideas, all the big global tech brands, whether it's Facebook or whether it's Twitter, and you're looking at crossing communities today, it happens to be tech. But for a person sitting and listening to you now thinking, well, you know what, I don't have a tech background, but I want to open a let's say, a store, a a food stall, a restaurant. So do you think that there are certain areas today that are more ripe for innovation? I think technology is, but there are equal opportunities in other disciplines as well. What do you think about this? So as recent as 10 years ago, technology was always considered its own industry. So the world is full of what we call targeted industries or defined targeted industries, like very strict pillars of, and and technology has always been a standalone. I think that's changed. And I think every industry is a technology company. Uh, And I can argue and debate with people when they say, I'm not in technology. And we can turn that around and say, well, actually you are because it's technology that is actually running your business or it's helping you scale your your business directly and indirectly, even if you don't think that it, that it is. So every business has the opportunity to be a tech company. And a lot of individuals are fearful of the word technology because they don't understand it or they don't have the skill set um, to build uh, a, a piece of technology. And that's fine. As long as you've got an idea and you know that it needs a solution, other people will build the technology for you. I'm not a technologist. I don't know the first thing about how to write code and algorithms and create software platforms or or create an app, but I know there's a problem that needs to be solved and this is the solution to do it. And then I'm gonna find the, the, the tribe, if you will, around me that will actually build the technology for me. Now, with that said, I think there's a lot of emphasis and probably too much focus that in order to be successful as an entrepreneur, you need to be a technology company. And I don't agree with that because as you said, there are other types of businesses that are out there and they may not involve technology and it may be opening up a storefront. It may be opening up a food truck. It may be um, some type of small business idea that has the potential to become a big idea that's not in the world of technology and maybe it goes into that world. but One of the things I want to be very careful about is that the world still needs to run. The economy still needs to operate successfully. It still requires people to do everything from basic functions that don't require technology to very complicated functions that does require technology. And it's like a puzzle. Everything is a piece of that puzzle. So I don't want to deter anyone away from starting a small business and staying as a small business or starting a small business that can grow that necessarily doesn't have to be technology um, focused. And if you look at the workforce today, a lot of people say, especially elderly populations, uh, that, oh my goodness, with all the advancement of technology and robotics, I'm gonna be without a job, I'm gonna be homeless. And the answer is, well, that's not true because we've gone through life since the beginning of humankind, all these different evolutions and eras and you're not going to be unemployed. You have to think about that as technology advances. You still need skilled people. Uh, You need upskills, you need new skills, you need reskilling in the workforce. So as a new piece of technology or emerging technology comes into our life, you need people to, to build it, to maintain it, to operate it. And those are new career pathways that didn't exist. And if you go back to 
the the 1700s, the 1800s, the 1900s, the 2000s, there's always been the evolution of of new career pathways based upon the changes that occur in our world. And the world, nobody knows where it's going to go. And there's technology and there's emerging technology. And there's technologies that we know of today. And there are technologies and other things that we don't even know exist yet that are beyond our own um, comprehension of what that's going to look like. So to go back to your question, I think there are opportunities to create businesses that involve technology, that do not involve technology, and don't be afraid to take whatever your dream is. If you see a, if you see an opportunity that needs a solution, just go do it, and you're going to be successful. And how you scale it is is up to you in terms of your own desire and ability to do so. Um, but just just go do it. That's, I mean, it's kind of like the Nike commercial, right? Just do it. Yeah. And interestingly, you mentioned, and I think this would be common, you mentioned uh, people would need different skills. So from what you are involved in as far as innovation is concerned or entrepreneurship is concerned or the future is concerned, if I would ask you to rate the top three skills as per what you think are going to be or are essential for the next 15 years of innovation, would you be able to list three for us, not in any particular order, but these are to you, fundamentally very important skills that we would need moving forward? Yeah, my answer might be a little different than most people. Um, and it, and it's, it's honestly, it's very hard. It's difficult because I think it depends on the person as well and what kind of industry environment or sector they're, they, they want to be in. But you have to be open-minded. If you're closed-minded, then you're not going to be innovative. You have to, you can't look at things in black and white terms. Everything needs to be looked at in more gray terms, realizing that there can't be boundaries around things. Um, a second one would be flexibility. You have to be able to adapt to the environment and all of the trends that are, you know, external trends that are occurring and and, and ride the wave, if you will. And, and, and then third, I think you have to determine what all define yourself. So are you a surfer? Or are you a chess player? And what I mean by that is a surfer is somebody that just goes with the flow every day. They're not really strategic in mind. And a chess player is somebody that doesn't go with the flow every day. They're very strategic in mind, knowing there's an objective and we got to get to that objective. And strategically, here's how we're going to get there. And if you find yourself being defined as a surfer, you need to really sit back and think for a moment and wonder, am I going to be successful if I'm an entrepreneur as it's defined? And and if the answer is that you're not a chess player and you're not strategic in thought and you don't have that strategic mindset, then um, you really may need to think about a plan B. But if you are the chess player and you are adaptable and you are flexible, then you have all of the stars lining up for you to be successful. And then it comes back to something I said earlier once you've decided that I am an entrepreneur and I'm in a bill thing, just don't forget three key things. You know, and you have to have the right plan, the right people, and the right money. And if one of those three things is, is considered wrong, then you need to come up with a corrective solution. Otherwise, um, you're probably not going to be successful with your venture. Interesting. And you mentioned a surfer and a chess player, for example, those could be inherent skills or a person is I guess either born thinking left brain or right brain now when you have students and within the educational system we teach different disciplines we have different faculties but somehow we don't tend to cover how does a person think right or is there a way to think right because you do you do have guidelines but do you think that within the academic world as well there is a lot of space for innovation when it comes to thinking and how does a person think strategically how does a person think in the right direction that's, that's this is a really great conversation so um i'm i'm one of the the few people that will stand up on a stage in a public environment and say that i believe there is a very large disconnect between academic institutions all over the world whether they're in the public sector or private sector and industry and i'm i'm what i would call some people say, John, you're an entrepreneur. I said, well, yeah, but I actually have another definition of who I am. And I and, and there are futurists, 
but I've taken that to another level. I call myself a, an applied futurist, meaning that I look into the future and I assume that the future is here now. And then I ask the question, what are we doing about it? And then coming up with strategic solutions. And then the next part of it being the applied futurist is that you actually implement those solutions. So to be an applied futurist, personally, I have to be very much aware of the trends and the challenges and the opportunities that exist in the world and try to forecast through the crystal ball where the world is going. And if you, and I do a lot of visuals, um, dashboards, if you will, and using data into visuals, if you think about academic institutions, starting at the like, preschool stage, all the way through the highest level of university as an example, uh, and then you look at industry, there's a gap, that it's a valley, and the valley is getting wider and wider every single year to the point that many academic institutions are closing their doors. You just don't have to don't hear about it. And industry is saying, I'm not getting the skill set or the mindset that I need out of certain programs. So I'm going to create my own programs, which has led to the creation of these corporate innovation uh, environments or corporate universities, if you will, where they train their own people to have certain skills uh, that are fit for that environment or that specific company. And I believe that there is a large disconnect between academia and industry in which traditionally academia has dictated to the world what the needs of industry are rather than truly listening to industry. And then industry has not done a good job of communicating to the academic institutions and the training organizations of what their needs are and then co-investing, like financially investing into education to provide career pathways, whether they're non-degreed or degree-based uh, pathways. And I think that there is a significant room for improvement within academic environments to help teach students starting at the earliest of age how to think. So it's not about thinking right or thinking wrong, but just how to think. And one of my fears is we have these emerging technologies. And I believe that in some cases, a lot of this technology is not allowing, especially our young population, to think at all. And if you think about the smartphone, so instead of thinking, we go to the smartphone, we ask our phone what the answer is, or chat GBT, and I'm dealing with a lot of challenges with my own colleagues and, and people that I interact with, well, chat GBT has become the thinking function for them, and it's truly not giving the results that one would expect or want. And we need to get back to thinking as a human being. And then we use the technology around us to help support and complement how we think and not do it the other way around where technology is telling us the way to think. So some guidance that I can provide for our listening audience, whether it's, it's the younger um, people out there or, or the parents and, and families that are supporting these young brilliant minds is never forget that the human was got a brain and the human was built to think and you need to limit how we use technology in that process. And I think that the academic world needs to do a better job of creating updated curriculum that is more relevant to the world in which we live today and the world that we are moving in as we think about the future. True, and I can actually give you my own example about maybe 20 years ago before I had a mobile phone or 15 years ago. I knew about, I would say, about 12 phone numbers. Today, I just know one. I just I just don't remember phone numbers because there is no need to. And because it's stored on the phone anyway. But in the good old days, I did know at least 10 phone numbers. So if that could happen to a person well past 30 and 40, the impact on a younger mind is more fundamental. But I guess the reason also could be today why there is a little bit of disconnect between uh, academia and the industry. And you brought up an interesting point because maybe the communication has not been clear. But maybe also because there's so much of change happening so fast that nobody is really sure which trend lasts. And if there is a trend that is on today, would that same job or skill be required 10 years from now earlier it was for the next 30 years you stay in one job and i mean my dad stayed in his job for like 40 years from the time he joined till the time he retired so i think because of this change the wuka world that we keep hearing about people are maybe not able to identify what is going to come from now 
Yeah. So the world, as you say, has has changed. I mean, my 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 parents, great examples. Where you you have one career, you stay with one employer, and you retire. And in today's world, I don't know what the average movement is now, but it's let's just say that a, a person changes their career five times, ten times, twelve times uh, before they retire, and in many cases, not retiring anymore. So the retirement age is going up, or people can't afford to retire, and they work right to the the end of life. And I think. It brings up a really interesting point of discussion, and I don't think the answers are solved uh, in, in an interview like this, but we have to be very aware that the, the, the world is in an accelerated uh, phase. We're in this era of acceleration, and it's never going to slow down. It's only going to keep accelerating, and the fear is that we as human beings may not be evolving at the same pace that technology is. So technology is ahead of us. And I don't think we're going to catch up to it, but it's also going to create some really good opportunities, but it's also going to create a number of challenges for us. And and, and I don't think that technology and human beings are, are moving in the same parallel direction. I think that it's like a car race and the human is racing really fast, but technology is racing even faster. And, and I think there are a lot of forthcoming challenges that we're not aware of yet and we'll deal with them as they come and humans are smart and we adapt um, to what that may look like but it brings up a good point about what kind of skills one needs and um, and I think that it's always important no matter where you are in your career whether it's an entrepreneur or you're working for for an organization is that we have to invest in our people your number one asset for a company is the people that you hire so as an investor am i investing in your idea or am i investing in you and your people and a very smart investor is going to believe in your idea but what they're actually doing is they're investing in you as an individual and you as an individual should be responsible for growing your company or your your teams by making sure that you're constantly providing the upskilling the new skills and the reskilling opportunities for your workforce and if you look at budgets and say the first thing i'm going to cut is training or investing in my people you should really sit back for a moment and see what the repercussions of that are going to be because if you don't have good people and qualified skilled talent then your business is essentially doomed because that's what runs the business. And uh, so it really comes down to upskills, new skills, and reskilling and uh, and being aware of what those opportunities are. And there's there's thousands of skills that one could can bring. But um, that's sort of my, my guidance advice for those that are trying to figure out what they would like to do with their life. John, uh, just a couple of questions before we let you go. I know we've taken a lot of your time, but thank you so much for that. And coming back to the initial model that you spoke about as far as the theme park is concerned, I just wanted to know from you, would you be able to replicate this somewhere else in the world? And that could be one way, uh, a measure to see whether if it works well, then it should work in another part of the world. And if you could let us know any new innovative ideas that you're really impressed with or you're consumed with these days. And my third part if I don't uh, get a chance to ask you this question is if you could leave us with uh, some advice to everybody listening. So when I set out to create the world's first theme park for entrepreneurs, I kind of joked that the end goal was global domination, meaning that if we could build an extremely successful model right here in the South Florida market, in the greater Fort Lauderdale, greater Miami uh, area, proof concept, show that we can create breakthrough ideas, that we can create new technologies, that we can create a new talent skills pipeline to support emerging tech opportunities, that we could create companies, we could um, create new jobs, and we could scale those companies. So those are the six metrics um, that we that we operate by. So three themes, four pillars, and six outcomes. And the idea was that if we could do it, then we would go to other regions of the world that are innovative in nature, and India is definitely on that list. And when I presented this model um, to a number of audiences, it started to get some validation. And interestingly, we, we just won the Global First Place Award uh, uh, for Outstanding Emerging Entrepreneurship Center by an organization called the Global Consortium of Entrepreneurship Centers, which represents the worldwide body of innovation and entrepreneurship centers. They validated that with our first place global award. So I know that we're doing something right. And my, my the next evolution of growth, which is a little further into the future, is to take this model, establish what I'll call a public-private partnership with government and industry 
in a country and then we take the same model and not copy it but replicate it because you have to adapt it to the region um, of, of the world that you're operating in but we follow the same three themes the same four pillars and the six uh, outcomes and we report to each other so that we're always offering similar programs and events and, and services and, and if we do that you begin to build a spider web all over the world that becomes interconnected and the next thing you know you're, you have economic development activities, education development activities, and ultimately economic prosperity. So my end mission at the end of the day is to have economic prosperity for all, whatever that may be defined as. So that's the vision of what we're building here. And the answer is yes, it can be very successful in other regions of the, of, of the world. And I would love the opportunity to work with partners in India because I think that's actually one of our logical first steps given the volume of entrepreneurs and the talent uh, that exists in India. Um, the second question, in terms of um, any thing that really has caught my eye. Um, so our particular model has been seeing some successes around sports technology and South Florida is a very big sports community. So we've actually had entrepreneurs develop technologies um, primarily around data that's resulted in improved operations and experiences for professional sports teams as an example. And in one of those cases, uh, we have a relationship with the Kingdom of the Netherlands where we were able to import a Dutch entrepreneur who set up shop here in the Innovation Center. We introduced them to the South Florida market and the next thing you know, they were securing clients with professional sports teams. Um, I'm also very intrigued by um, the world of space, and we actually have a, a space partnership program. It's sort of a word that we made up here, and we're trying to show entrepreneurs that they can be in the space economy. So how do you take your idea and pivot it to support space? So it could be for on Earth or inner or outer space applications. And what I've recognized in particular, one company that we're working with, they produce food in unusual habitats and what they've now been able to recognize as a result of being involved with us, that they're actually a, a, a space food company and they have the ability to grow food on a space station or potentially on Mars, which needs to be self-sustaining. So those kinds of things um, come through our, our doors. Um, I, I literally have 180 plus entrepreneurs that we're working with right now across all kinds of different sectors and um, and I'm just really intrigued and it's not all technology uh, but we're coming up with some very innovative uh, ways of doing things but a lot of it comes down to data and how do you use data to make really informed decisions that help businesses uh, grow so that's one of the other skill sets I think people should be aware of is how you look at data how you interpret data, how you analyze it, and how you uh, apply it. And then the third question, um, to leave some, some advice uh, for our listening audience, I think it comes back to some of the things I've already said, is that you really have to understand what the world of entrepreneurship is like, knowing that it's not going to be an easy route. You're going to get extreme rewards. It's going to be an amazing journey, but it is tough. It's challenging. and, and you're probably going to wake up every day with a bunch of sticky notes on your desk that say, here's what I got to do today, knowing that you're never going to touch any of those sticky notes. And they just keep compounding and compounding and compounding. And I'm looking at my desk right now of all the things I'm supposed to be doing that I'm not doing because every single day is different. So one thing I didn't mention is that if you go into a, a job in, in, a, in a regular work environment, which is, is great and not saying anything negative about it, realize that it's more structured and you're going to work hypothetically 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and have regular time off, etc. As an entrepreneur, that's not the case, right? There's no 9 to 5 um, job. Um, you're not going to have time off per se, and you are going to work your butt off, um, but it's ultimately because you're doing it because you, of your dreams, your passion, uh, your enthusiasm. And once you get into the world of entrepreneurship, your friendship network becomes other entrepreneurs. And 24-7, you are surrounded by people that have the same thought process, the same energy, the same passion and compassion uh, for what you're doing. And I think the most important thing that I can put out there, um, and I actually, I, I did a TED Talk not that long ago on the founder's journey, what it's like to be an entrepreneur. And it's, it's hit a lot of different audiences. And I would encourage you, you can look my name up in, in TEDx uh, and you'll find it. Um, the last thing I, that I say is find, find your tribe, find your network. So basically go find your innovation center 
And if you can find your innovation center and get into that network, all of your entrepreneurial dreams are going to be taken from there. They are going to help you um, get to the next level. So that's that's really your challenge. Find your incubator, your accelerator, your your innovation center, and and if anybody wants to reach out to me personally, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to provide guidance and advice um, as well. I, I do get overwhelmed by people contacting me, but there is a website. And if you go to Nova, N-O-V-A dot E-D-U forward slash innovation, um, you'll see our innovation center and what we're doing. And then my name, um, you can look up on LinkedIn, John Wensveen. And uh, funny enough, I actually have a very big um, network in India but you're welcome to reach out to me. It may take me a little time to get back to you, but I but I do respond to everybody that reaches out and I'm happy to provide some guidance in terms of how you achieve your dreams. And John, once again, from all of us here, thank you so much. Before we let you go on a lighter note, uh, we have to tell you that uh, the Indian Genes podcast, what we're currently doing is the only podcast on Mars. And technically and officially, that's just on a lighter note, but when the Perseverance rover did go up there about four years ago, three years ago, there was a competition to send names. So we sent Indian Genes Podcast as a name and we, because it was going to be on a chip and left on Mars. So we officially got a ticket back from there saying this is your registration number. So we don't have a name there, but you do have a podcast there officially. <laughs> so. Wow, that is that is so exciting to hear. And, and, and I wish you could see me right now because I'm in my office and I have space memorabilia and I actually have a space jacket that we've had created for some of our space efforts. And um, I'm, and, and I'm, we've created a space flag that's actually going to space on a Blue Origin uh, ship in the not too distant future. But wow. you just made my day. Like this is out of this world. Hey, we're broadcasting from Mars and some capacity. So Look. I'm excited to hear that, that you've had your own success there. And uh, that's just absolutely yeah. amazing. Let's and, just say that's out of this world. Out of this, and, and John, you can you can officially say that you're uh, you're on the only uh, the only podcast that's on Mars. Maybe a lot of, wow. lot of the other podcast here, but there's only one podcast on Mars. All right. I've, we're going to claim that. I'm going to tell, tell all my network. This is awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much, John. इस हब हॉपर ओरिजिनल को सुनने के लिए आपका शुक्रिया अगर आप भी अपना पॉडकास्ट लॉन्च करना चाहते हैं तो हब हॉपर स्टूडियो वेबसाइट पे रजिस्टर करें और एक मिनट के अंदर अंदर अपना खुद का पॉडकास्ट लॉन्च करें यही नहीं स्टूडियो देता है आपको पूरी आजादी कहीं भी कभी भी अपना पॉडकास्ट लॉन्च करने की सिर्फ तीन आसान स्टेप्स में तो साथ में अपना पॉडकास्ट शुरू करने के लिए तैयार जस्ट हॉप ऑन हब हॉपर simply content